Mindia. Mind of India. Who was Etsy Javaria? Etsy Javaria was a landscape designer, um, a horticulturist, a gardener, and a gentleman. And he is one of those people whom we have to thank for the way the city looks today. We all know Bangalore is a garden city. Well, he's one of the reasons why it was named a garden city and why it sustained that moniker for many years. A city is not just the buildings, a city is not just the ecology, and a city is not just the people. A city is relationships, and it's the relationships with people to the buildings, people to the ecology, people to the heritage, for our own well-being and for the well-being of all the species that are with us in the city. Right? And so that, I think, was the legacy of uh, visionaries like Javaraya. Though they were administrators, they had an idea of a city as a place of well-being. As an horticulturist, he was par excellence. Rao Bahadur Hesi Jauraya's legacy should be perpetuated for the immense work that he has done in and around Bangalore, in Lal Bagh, Kaban Park, Nandi Hills, many gardens around the government buildings of Bangalore, as well as the royal buildings of Mysore, Palace, etc., etc. Mr. Javareya's first assignment was that of a horticulture assistant in Lal Bagh 109 years ago. I'm standing on a street which has Feltoforum uh, trees. These trees were planted by Javareya at the instance of Sir Mirza Ismail, who loved the carpet of yellow with the petals falling down early in the morning every day. And he took his horticulturalists around Bangalore to plant the Feltoforum wherever he wanted it. Now, Javareya not only started his career in Lal Bagh, of the places he worked in, the largest number of years was spent in Lal Bagh, and he lived in Lal Bagh Cottage where his children grew up. The Lal Bagh that we see today is basically the contribution of three people. Cameron, Krumbigal, and Javaraya. One reads in the history that Heather Ali actually laid down the garden and Tipu was fond of red flowers. That's how it got the name Lal Bagh. That's what we read. But Lal Bagh, as we know today, is the contribution of these three people. Nalvedi Krishna Jr. Sir Mirza Ismail. It's like a milk and honey combination. Both of their ideas would gel together like that because, of course, they were classmates also uh, during earlier years. So, obviously, Krishna Jhuriyar had great uh, respect and belief in Sir Mirza and it is vice versa. Sir Mirza was a person with a lot of aesthetic sense. He had a craze to make Bangalore a beautiful city. Not only Bangalore, the whole state of Mysore Samsthana, that is called Mysore province. Whole Mysore province was made uh, beautiful. And fortunately for Sir Mirza, he got very good articultural officers like H.C. Javaraya. In that period, under Krishnaj Vadyar, you had a sudden efflorescence of culture, which produced people like R.K. Narayan, R.K. Lakshman, um, R.K. Shrikantan, Veena Doriswami Ayengar, M.N. Srinivas, the sociologist, Raja Ramana, the scientist and the other scientists, writers, etc. And he was the horticulturist. 
who was part of that culture and who sort of grew up in that atmosphere. So his total contribution to the culture of Old Mysore was very significant. Javraya is a typical person who is uh, like a gentleman who was brought up in this whole idea of Mysore modern, where uh, the Mysore modern represented uh, a very progressive kind of state that was a very significant thing in establishing uh, not only economically but also culturally and socially. So in this cultural scene, we can see Javraya as a very interesting personality. Someone who had a heart which was very native, but somebody who was very westernized in the way he looks and the way he kind of worked also. His father was uh, Rao Saheb Lok Sevanirutha H. Chennaya. His parents, Beluraya and Lakshmama, supposed to have migrated to somewhere near Markara for better living conditions, I suppose. And he was an agriculturist there. He gave importance to his son Chanaya's education and justifiably so, Chanaya did very well, which enabled him to get into the service in Kodugu, and then known as Kurk. My great-grandfather, H. Chanaya, uh, was working as a judge in Kurk and when he retired he moved to Bangalore to educate all his children uh, and to make the most of the British ed education available in the city and they all graduated and went on to uh, having good careers. His background of his grandfather, his father, grandfather's uh, an agriculturist and having born and grown in the celebrous surroundings of Madikeri on the Western Ghats naturally would have had an impact on him and it was but natural that he uh, took to nature and its beauty and he started uh, you know, pursuing uh, his uh, studies in agriculture and horticulture. His early education was at uh, St. Joseph's European High School, Bangalore but he finished his matriculation from uh, the Central High School in Merkara. From there, he moved on to Central College, where he excelled in sports and studies. He wanted to study agriculture, so the India's oldest uh, agricultural college was being shifted from Chennai to Coimbatore, and he was one of the first batches at Coimbatore. In 1913, after his graduation, HCG applied for two jobs. One was in the government garden department, and the other was at the agricultural department. Uh, he got both the jobs and when it came to deciding which one, he joined the government gardens and worked under Krumbigal. Krumbigal was hired by Krishna Rajendra Odia and he came to Bangalore in 1908. So he played a very important role not only as a landscapist but also as a town planner. And he was uh, known for his uh, cereal blossoming of uh, bringing in different kinds of species of trees into Bangalore and curating it in such a way that it could blossom serially at different times of the year. So we are also indebted to Krumbigal in many ways, other than just being an important director of the Lalbagh Horticulture Department. After Krumbigal, I think the most significant thing is that uh, H.C. Javaraya became a very important native uh, superintendent of Lal Bagh. Great grandfather and HC, they were more than just work colleagues. They were friends, they were curates, so they had this bond about the plants and the trees and how things should look. Within a year of coming to Lal Bagh, in 1914, Javaraya accepted an assignment as Mukteshwar to the Maharaja of Mysore, uh, that is to oversee the estates and the gardens of the Maharaja of Mysore within Mysore. So this is the 
Madhubana as it is understood today, where we have several generations of the Wadiyars cremated. But a hundred years ago, during Jawaraya's time, this was not the Madhubana. The Madhubana was a garden that was adjacent to, but not the same as the Brindavana. And it was in the Madhubana that there were actually flowers that were grown to supply to the palace for their use in, in puja. There were fruits and vegetables that were grown here that was again supplied to the palace and there was alfalfa that was supplied for the horses in the royal stables. Javaria was the one who actually worked on the fruit cultivation there and so of course there were a lot of experiments done with manuring with trials on which fruits would grow where, which ones would be better, timing of the planting and so on and so forth. But he, he was the one who actually put in a lot of the fruit cultivation there. So his tenure in Mysore was four long useful years, at the end of which then Maharaja Nalwadi Krishna Raja Vadaher gifted him with a gold watch. It is inscribed and dated 1918. So for about four or five years he spent shuttling between Mysore and Bangalore and did up all the, you know, curated all the gardens there. During those days, much importance was given by the Mysore uh, uh, state, uh, the you know, kingdom uh, for the much, you know, greenery and also the garden development. Initially, the, uh, the small post was given to H.C. Javraya and he was looking after the palace property and the palace gardens. And later on, actually, G.H. Krumbigal has recommend, recommended him for a assistant uh, superintendent post. Javaraya subsequently, after four years in Mysore, came back to Lalbagh at, towards the end of the First World War. When this happened, Krumbigal, who was head of the Lalbagh Gardens, was in turn, because he was a German national, and he was considered an enemy alien. In place of Krumbigal, then uh, Javaraya was made the superintendent. And that was, I think, a major watershed in the development of both Lalbagh and uh, in the life of Javaraya. Lalbagh was quite possibly where great grandfather found home. Now, when great-grandfather was in the war prison and the running of Lalbar was in the hands of the horticultural department, um, great-grandfather was adamant that the only natural next to put in tendered could be HC because he would be able to take Lulbagh up to the next level. Javaraya was his understudy but only one or two years into his working life suddenly took over as officiating superintendent of Lalbagh in Krumbagel's absence. He would suddenly had to take on a lot of responsibility which he did effortlessly and this led actually to a great growth uh, horticulturally and in botany for Javaraya. It was September 1922 when Javaraya went to England, specifically to the Royal Botanic Garden, which we all call Kew Gardens. And he was sent there by the uh, Mysore government. He spent about a year there and it was a wonderful time for him because it was a great opportunity giving him the chance to interact with some of the best minds in horticulture. And he was probably the first horticulturist from this part of the country to go to Kew Gardens. Javaraya spent 12 months in Kew Gardens and then he asked for an extension of another six months from the government of Mysore, which they readily agreed to. When in Kew Gardens, Mr. A. W. Hill, the director, writes of Javaraya. He says he joined the practical horticulture department, spent time at the museum and the herbarium, and went out on horticulture excursions out of Kew Gardens, and overall got a very good understanding of economic botany and commercial botany. One of the things he learned was specialized technique for tree surgery. 
he learnt it from a specialist in Kew and he was the first to come and implement this specific technique in Bangalore. Another highlight of his trip was a visit that he could make to Ghent, which is in Belgium. What was called Europe's greatest flower show used to happen. So there again, he, he uh, went across to Belgium and he attended that and interacted with people there. Where uh, again, his diligence and uh, work ethics earned him the credit of his uh, director who proposed uh, his name for the fellowship of the Linnaean Society. So he is an FLS, which is a very creditable uh, fellowship. And also he is a fellow of the Royal Horticultural Society. Many years later when he bought his house, he named it Kew Garth, where Kew is of course from Kew and Garth here means like a clearing in a forest or it could mean like a cloistered space. So Kew Garth was what he named his house. I'll read out from a book, uh, my own book actually, on the Javaraya chapter, where Krumbagal is left in 1932, that is the end of his tenure. And he writes this letter about Javaraya, that's 1934. In all the various activities involving the government gardens, the horticultural gardens, town planning and architecture, he, Javaraya, has acquired an unequaled wide experience, not only in technical architecture, including vegetables and fruit culture, and also in its wider connection and application to social activities, town planning and architecture, in all of which I'm glad to certify. He has shown great interest and ability. He has developed a keen sense of responsibility and breadth of thought, which should assure him success in his future career. Bangalore sits in a confluence of Eastern Ghats and Western Ghats at a height of around 1000 meters up. So there is, the whole environment is a blessed environment. You will always see a static temperature, very uh, you know, soothing to the plants as well as human life. That's where uh, Britishers started making this a, their hope. Bangalore is a city where nature was everywhere. Whether it's in the streets that you, you know, had the large avenue trees or also the smaller parks that are everywhere. You know, it could be a hospital compound, it could be a public space, a government building with a garden, it could be a museum like the museum spaces with the gardens or it could be just the small parks that are there in the neighbourhood. So these are very important from the biodiversity point of view, from the mental health and physical health and well-being of the city and for things like uh, pollution control. The Maharaja of Mysore, along with his officials, made a very concerted effort to include greenery in their plans. So, for example, you take the layouts of Basavangudi and Maleshwaram, which came up after the plague hit in 1898. Uh, the reason they were set up was because there was a concern about overcrowding. And after that, all government offices and uh, circuit houses, IDs, government institutions, they were all situated in gardens. Hospitals had gardens, the government offices had gardens, and Jawaraya was the one who looked after these gardens. They took special care that uh, the roads were all white, there were street trees everywhere, there were parks in between. So if you look at Vasamgudi, for example, there's that large open area in the middle, no? uh, which today we call the MN Krishna Rao Park. So these kind of open spaces and street trees were part of the plan. You get a sense of how that planning was integrated. You know, you had M.N. Krishna Rao Park integrated into the heart of the city. And that's the vision he's left behind. It's because that vision was there that we could then take, uh, for instance, a Jayanagar or a J.P. Nagar and say there must be parks here. Or there must be open spaces created which could be greened. And these were actually, many of them, uh, looked after and even established, uh, even designed and put in there by Javaraya. So I think we tend to forget about those gardens, which many of them have been lost or they have been, they've shrunk over time. So it was not just the Lalbagh and the uh, Kaban Park which uh, made Bangalore the garden city. It is these gardens which collectively made Bangalore the garden city. 
that vision that he had and the parks that he is left behind i think that culture is very important for us in the city and unfortunately we've forgotten that as the city expands we're not keeping that in the periphery of the city so i think we need to relook at these people who understood how how cities needed to develop and maintain this culture as as the city grows as a child i've seen uh, uh, in the bugle rock park where he had uh, very well executed a natural garden he added to the forest look of that area by having lianas or you know some of those thick 2 to 3 inches climbers i have seen it myself and used to play with it and i've seen the similar ones in uh, uh, kaban park too he has left behind uh, his footprints and legacy in his professional career which are uh, testimonials and uh, proof enough for his uh, creativity so in this cultural scene we can see jawraya as a very interesting personality someone who had a heart which was very native but somebody who was very westernized in the way he looks and the way he kind of worked also and this is reflected through his life through his various activities he was for example a very good sportsman he was a very good golfer he was captain of the century club golf course and he is known to have made a hole in one on the 15th round at the century club golf course for which he got the batman cup trophy now this probably has not been replicated since uh, by anybody else jawarai also to encourage other people to take up golf set up a golf course in the nandi hills grandfather jawaraya was educated in the st joseph's european high school and uh, central college he interacted with the british uh, officials well and had excellent uh, british manners he was a disciplinarian he was very particular and methodical of whatever he did he maintained good records he was a dapper dresser he fitted in very well in the uh, rule of those days and uh, he was not only a good master he was a good subordinate too his family was also expected to come dressed to dinner and had to eat at the table with a fork and spoon this influence also extended to my grandmother who, who hailed from a village in hasan district she learned and mastered english and uh, she interacted with the british officials and the english ladies as being the spouse of this uh, rising horticultural e- expert uh, she learned to play tennis and i believe she used to play tennis with my uh, grandfather in uh, lalbagh in the tennis courts one significant thing i can tell you is that he was someone who extended the eastern side of uh, the lalbagh glass house and made it almost a perfect roman cross glass house in lalbagh bangalore is known as the jewel of lalbagh it was built in 1888 by john cameron when he was the director at that time for the historical glass house of lalbagh the foundation stone was laid by albert victor during 1889 so that was during uh, cameron's period and in fact actually the whole responsibility was given to mac perlin company of glasgow and they brought uh, the cast iron pillars and also the glazing materials from london it was actually you know built on the model of crystal palace of london but when nalbadi krishnaraj wadia saw this he wanted to have an extension so that instead of having a cross shape we will have a plus shape So somewhere in 1935 when Rao Bahadur H.C. Jawaraya was the superintendent of Lal Bagh he requested him to build another wing to the eastern side of the glass house which should be similar to that by that time Jawaraya was known for his aesthetic contributions to Lal Bagh this is the fourth wing of glass house Uh, built uh, during uh, Jawaraya's period, and all the you know materials required for glass house, uh, the steel uh, pillars, and also the basic uh, 
you know, rust materials required for the glasses. They brought it uh, from Badravati Iron Works company. Uh, instead, actually, other part of the glasses, basically all the material came from uh, London, but uh, this was uh, locally made. Which replicated the kind of wrought iron uh, pillars that were made from England. The foundation stone for this was laid by Sir Mirza Ismail on 8th February 1935. But the engineer and the superintendent or the director, they took the uh, issue so seriously. Within no time, the Eastern Wing was built. And this is a very interesting fact that uh, his work was greatly acknowledged by Mirza Ismail. It's very important to also uh, acknowledge Mirza Ismail and Javariya's uh, friendship because uh, Mr. Mirza Ismail was uh, responsible for a very um, kind of expansive uh, promotion of Bangalore, uh, Bangalore's landscape. And one of the things that Mr. Javariya did was uh, this extension of the east side of the glass house. During flower show, people come and they go into the glass house and during, uh, even the show is not there, people do come here. But hardly any people know the difference between the three wings and the fourth wing. They do not know the fourth wing was done by our own Indians, our own officers, our own Kannadigas. So if you see Lalba, guard room is one of the iconic structures. It is not within the premises of Lalbagh, but it is at the edge. It's that defining the West Gate. You know, now it's like become an iconic uh, representative of the West Gate. How did it come here? It wasn't part of the original plan. It so happened that in 1940, when uh, there was this house of Divan Krishnamurti that was being acquired by the government, and they were modifying it, and uh, the compound wall was being raised, and at that time. Uh, Divan Mirza Ismail and uh, Javraya, he they visited this site uh, to supervise the work. And when he saw this, when Javraya saw this structure over there, he was saying that let's preserve it. Can we conserve this structure? So the interesting point about uh, this lantern-shaped uh, structure is that when it is lit from inside, it looks like a lantern. Otherwise, it is a guard room. And he gave this great idea that that structure, because it was a stone structure, they could dismantle it and rebuild it elsewhere. He dismantled the structure stone by stone. You know, every stone there was numbered, removed, and then dismantled and shifted and relocated to this particular place, defining the west gate that we have now. Incidentally, Mr. Javraya invited Mirza Ismail to the west gate and he was pleasantly surprised to see this monument being transplanted into Lal Bagh, thus retaining a piece of history and also a kind of a, a structure which was very beautiful in, this, in the city's landscape. And this is a very interesting approach in conservation where we kind of preserve structures by, by shifting them to places where they are more safer than where they were earlier. And in fact, if we see in the 20th century, this is one of the greatest initiatives, even though it's a small structure, but the way they took this approach of dismantling it and rebuilding it, I think it represents the early 20th century conservation approach that we've had here. When he was a superintendent in Lalbagh Botanical Gardens, he was very instrumental. And uh, he wanted to you know, improve the landscape uh, quality, and uh, the, he wanted to add a new adornment to the existing uh, you know, beauty of Lalbad. One of the other natural kind of monuments in Lalbagh is the Jaya Falls. Uh, it is uh, constructed just next to the larger tank. When the tank overflowed, this particular water body uh, flowed into a lotus tank. And this uh, was kind of structured in a way that it looks like a natural fall fall with granite stones. And during that time actually it was a big attraction. So that was named basically as a Jaya Falls and later on we call it as a Javraya Falls. H.C. Javraya never left any opportunity to use any corner of Lal Bagh to beautify it. Of course for the sake of the people to come and enjoy and appreciate the beauty of Lal Bagh. 
I mean, the personality of Javraya is such that he took these challenges and kind of pushed them to, a, to another extent. It was uh, a very physical thing to do, but at the same time he was very cautious about uh, the situation, the, the conditions and the historical uh, context. Apples are a temperate crop and they are adapted to climate where uh, in the winter when it's very very cold they go into a dormant phase and they need this dormant phase for them to actually set fruit. So what do you do in a place like Bangalore? There is, the, there is a winter but it's not cold enough for the apples to go into dormancy. So this is the thing that Javaraya worked around and so he came up with a technique where at first like when the plants are about four years old you stop watering them for a couple of weeks and then after that you expose the roots at the bottom okay and uh, what happens is a few days after this the leaves will start wilting and when that happens then you cover up the soil again you cover up the roots once again you fertilize the plant you water it and then within about a fortnight you see they start flowering and then about a month later you have the fruit so this was a technique which uh, allowed the people to actually get two crops of apples per year. This is something that Javaraya actually wrote a scientific paper about and even today when there are people writing about apple cultivation and research, this is a paper that is cited and he is acknowledged as being the first to uh, do this kind of a technique anywhere in the, in the tropics at all. His experiment in uh, growing temperate climate crop in uh, Bangalore was uh, something uh, remarkable and I think that was a good horticultural breakthrough but uh, it wasn't really followed up later by his successors that he succeeded. He was a relentless champion of fruit cultivation. This is a thread that you see throughout his career. He set up the, a fruit cooperative he helped set up this institution whereby people could actually uh, avail of loans to grow fruits. Uh, he helped revive the fig cultivations in Ganjam, which had been defunct for a very long time. And of course, Javaraya particularly, I think, can be considered like the fruit man of Mysore in some ways. Of course, one of the things he's most associated with is apples. Um, there are photos of him holding the Rome Beauty apple, for example. There are photos of him in Hesagata. Again, a fruit uh, research station that he helped set up. In 1932, the Imperial Council of Agriculture Research invited proposal uh, to set up schemes for horticulture and horticultural research. They were willing to fund it. HCG was very interested as he was passionate about fruit cultivation. He wrote a very strong proposal. This proposal he presented to the ICAR at a meeting in Shimla and of course the ICAR really liked the proposal and so they agreed to fund part of it. So a part of it was funded by ICAR and a part of it, of course the Mysore government gave the land for this. This was what came up in Hesargetta. It was only in 1938 that it got approved. Till then all states were lobbying for it. And by the time this actually came up, Javaraya himself was no longer in Bangalore. He was serving at that time in Delhi. Somewhere in, after two, three years, 1934-35, his services was uh, required by the uh, imperial government, Delhi, to start a new department called the Agricultural Produce Marketing Department, of which he was chosen as the head. While working as a senior marketing officer, uh, in the Indian subcontinent. He traveled extensively from uh, Kabul to uh, Rangoon, from Kashmir to Kanyakumari. He noticed there was a wide variety in the agricultural products. There was uh, a lot of waste as well as disease in the agricultural products. He brought it up to his supervisor, Mr. A.M. Livingston. Because you see, as marketing officer, he was responsible for exporting the produce. And in that, 
you needed both grading and quality. The Agricultural Grade, Grading and Produce Marketing Act was passed in 1937. This is where AgMark was born. Uh, as children, we've grown up uh, looking at Agmark ghee and Agmark honey and all those things, for example. So Agmark was something that was introduced by the ICAR during Javaraya's time. And in fact, it was Javaraya who helped uh, write the preliminary reports on fruit cultivation in many parts of the country, uh, which led to some of the standardizing procedures for fruit produce, for example, and export. The first consignment of Alfonso mangoes was sent to London in 1937. This was uh, supervised by my grandfather who selected, graded and certified the mangoes to be shipped to London. And uh, 1,200 mangoes were sent to London in this very first consignment. When we say Agmark for fruit produce, we talk about grading, for example. It's important that they are, if, you know, they're all of a certain particular quality. So all these standards were brought in for fruits by uh, Jagaraya. And he uh, did his job to the utmost satisfaction of the government. And thereupon, the then uh, Viceroy of India, Lord Lindlithgow, conferred upon the title Rao Bahadur in recognition of his services. But when he returned in 1940, he was in charge of FRS. This later became the National Horatorium and later became the Indian Institute of Horticultural Research. If IHR is set up in Bangalore, it's thanks to Javaraya's work on the fruit research scheme, the fruit research station as it was called. That was the reason IHR came up here. because he had set up this center and later on once the state amalgamated with India after independence then it was converted into Indian Institute of Horticulture Research and taken over by the ICAR, Indian Council of Agricultural Research. He built many gardens, orchards, and uh, did exemplary work in Lalbagh and Kaban Park. And this can be seen even today. This has inspired the, uh, the new Bangalore Terminal 2 uh, to develop this uh, green concept. Nearly 1,400 species are currently seen in uh, Lalbagh. Their introduction, their initial data says it's around 4,000 species what they introduce. Currently surviving species is around 1,200 to 1,600 uh, during their last uh, book release what they mentioned in those books. The idea was how can bring back those 4,000 species what they introduced earlier. That inspired us to work uh, in the you know, footsteps of uh, both Krimbigal as well as uh, Javraya sir. The benchmark study what influenced me to actually deliver this terminal as a terminal in a garden was the uh, Lalbagh and the Kaban Parks. So that helped us to study what works well here, what plants they introduce from worldwide, what works well here, which grown to their larger capacity. This influenced us to start with uh, you know, uh, planning a terminal in a garden, especially the efforts put in at a later stage by uh, Krumbigal and uh, Javaraya ji so helped us to uh, bring in all those plant materials which were initially introduced currently missing in Lalbagh and uh, Kaban Park. It looks like Javaraya is forgotten in the pages of history of Bangalore and he needs to be acknowledged for the incredible work that he's contributed for Bangalore and the state of uh, Mysore. But the people who know about him, people who love his work, really get pained for the way in which such great people. I consider H.C. Javaraya as one of the greatest builder of Bangalore. This immense contribution to the gardens, the horticulture and the beauty of Bangalore as a mark of respect and tribute 
the main northern gate or the Cameroon gate uh, on the northern side has a circle in front and that circle has been named after uh, Javaraya. It is called the Rao Badur Hitsi Javaraya Circle. None of the grandchildren were fortunate enough uh, to see their grandfather as he died very young at the age of 57 of a heart attack. Uh, but we had, from a young age, heard about his achievements. It would be nice if we could bring back the greenery to Bangalore as envisioned by H.C. Javaraya and G.H. Krumbigal and make this uh, Bangalore a green place again and would help fight global warming and climate change. Mind India. Mind of India.